Hi, welcome back to our uh, next lecture. And this lecture is called American Exceptionalism. It's about how American culture is different from other Western cultures. And I recommend before you watch this lecture to read an article by Seymour Martin Lipset called The Double-Edged Nature of American Exceptionalism. It's in the packet with this, uh, with this lecture. Uh, and it's maybe uh, a little hard to understand, but we will discuss many of the concepts he talks about in the lecture. And then afterwards, <clears throat> I encourage you to read it again to see if you, if you can understand it a little better. So it's good practice for when you go to college and have to read higher level material. America, like every other society, has its own unique social structure and values things that make it a little different from other societies. And of course, uh, every society has its own uniqueness. This is one of the reasons why it's always interesting to travel around the world and see the different cultures and values and ways people interact. On the other hand, we don't like to say that any society is monolithic. All societies has, have variation inside different opinions for different people. So we don't want to create stereotypes, uh, like the, the joke about Texans always thinking that they're better than everybody else. Um, so we don't want to think of creating stereotypes, but at the same time, there are certain things that make different cultures unique. So we can look at these general patterns and trends. And usually the differences are going to be based on the unique historical events, the traditions that help create that culture, the environment perhaps within that culture formed, the conflicts that have helped shape that culture over, over the years. <clears throat> so this article, Seymour Martin Lipset, American Exceptionalism, A Double-Edged Sword, was an, an attempt to explain ways in which America is systematically different from many other countries. He starts off with this interesting argument that Americanism, that is the belief in America, is a belief system. It's almost a creed. Americans like to think that they're, they're, they're somehow different from other countries. And he's kind of saying that in a way we, we are. Um, that other countries say are oh, English, I'm German, and that means, of course, something to them. But Americans really believe that uh, America was built upon uh, certain core beliefs. So some of those, for example, liberty, egalitarianism, individualism, populism, and laissez-faireism, we should probably say. So, for example, compared to Europe, in Europe, uh, European countries develop social welfare states very early on, early, late uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century. Most Europeans had a social welfare state that were put in place by conservatives, not necessarily by socialists. Um, and the reason they did that in many cases is they believed that providing welfare would help protect society against revolution. So most European countries have social welfare states, not because they were socialistic, but rather because the conservatives believed that this was the best way of conserving their societies. Most European political systems, particularly since World War II, have been alliances between these conservatives and social democratic or labor parties. Europeans are far more likely to put key matters in the hands of the state. So every European country has a universal health care program, something the United States has consistently refused to develop. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that also led many European states to be taken over by fascists or communists. Whereas America never really came close to that. Even during the Great Depression in the 1930s, when there was a huge a number of unemployed, uh, 25 to 30 percent unemployment in the United States, families being uprooted, uh, people uh, roaming the country homeless, uh, 
America never seriously considered uh, a fascist or a communist solution to that problem. Let's analyze some of these terms that supposedly make America different from the rest of the world, such as liberty. Doesn't everybody love liberty? You might say, right? The French in their revolution, they had uh, the free uh, slogans, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, fraternity, right? So you'd say, don't they love liberty as much as us? But Keep in mind, when we talk about values or terms like liberty, they can mean very different things to, to different people. So liberty, for example, the French gave us the Statue of Liberty to symbolize uh, America uh, as a shining beacon to the world, saying here's a place you can be free. And what did they mean by that? I'm not entirely sure, but for Americans, Liberty very often means freedom from government intervention over all else. There's a strong cultural resistance to any uh, strong government uh, assertion over everyday life. Uh, America, like I said before, has never really supported a fascist or a socialist solution to social problems uh, or almost any general state intervention in the economy. As I said before, we have never uh, allowed a universal health care program. We don't even have national ID cards. Each state has its own ID card. Um, so and the Constitution <clears throat> is sprinkled <clears throat> with restrictions on government powers, things Congress cannot do, things that uh, the, the president cannot do, things even the Supreme Court cannot do. So these were all put in place to limit the role or the importance of government in everyday life. Think of the rights of suspects. Many people complain about law and order, particularly more conservative Americans complain about law and order. We need to crack down on crime. We need to crack down on criminal types. But it's interesting in the, that the US Constitution specifically protects the rights of people who are suspected of crime, not only in the amendments, there's the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, have very specific <clears throat> rights for, <clears throat> for individuals who are accused of crimes. <clears throat> the Constitution also mandates trial by jury. It mandates the right of habeas corpus. In other words, you cannot simply be grabbed by officials and locked in a room without being told your rights and without a period of time and being able to talk to a lawyer. And you say, why, why do we if, we, if we don't like crime, why do we have all these protections for criminals? Um, well, we have certainly some of the broadest rights for criminal suspects in the world. Anti-statism. Uh, compared to Europeans, Americans tend to have much less faith in, a, in government solutions. We have a very weak welfare state. We have the lowest taxes compared to any other any European country. Um, we, we allow, for example, money for poor people, uh, but we don't allow the government uh, or we restrict the government's control over ways families are regulated. Uh, there's, again, resistance to universal health care. Think about the, the Second Amendment debate. <clears throat> Europeans cannot understand why Americans allow free sale of guns. I'm not going to get into the debate, but simply the point that people who, who believe that the Second Amendment gives them uh, an absolute right to control or to, to have weapons believe and perhaps they're right that this is something that they're supposed to have in the, the Constitution in order to control the power of the government. And these are people on both the right and the left. Think also that there's no real or never been a real conservative party in the United States. In Europe, conservatives meant people who supported the old monarchical and aristocratic system. They were called Tories. <clears throat> 
These were people who supported the monarchy, supported the aristocracy. In other words, they supported the ancien, the old regime. Um, they, but there's also been no real social democratic party, like a Labour party that they have in England, or almost every other country in Europe has a social democratic party, which are usually semi-socialistic parties that advocate state control over the economy. We have Republicans and we have Democrats, but both of these are liberal parties. In other words, they are associated with the Whigs. These were the parties in England that supported free trade and the free market and the abolition of state control over the economy and over most social life. The <clears throat> differences that we talk about between conservatives and, and, and liberals in the United States is actually on social issues. Typically, when we say conservative, we mean somebody who has more conservative social beliefs and liberals as people who believe that people should be more free to choose their own lifestyle. So that's, but that's n nothing compared to the division in Europe historically between conservatives and liberals and social democrats. Equality, again, the French Revolution said, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And Americans have really bought into that from the beginning. Um, a man named Alexis de Tocqueville, who was a French uh, scholar, came to America. And this is one of the most important things he felt that made America unique. In America, people didn't just talk about equality. There was a real sense of equality. Now, this may seem paradoxical because, of course, at the same time, America had radical inequality on racial lines and on gender lines and also real inequality in terms of the amount of money people have. But despite that, Americans tend to believe that from a moral point of view, everybody is equal. Uh, also think of the way that American culture tends towards the, the middle. Both rich and poor copy the middle class in styles and values. Uh, we are, again, Americans are happy in a way to pick or, or use cultural attributes of even the poor uh, or other uh, racial groups. So, for example, our music, the influence of uh, Hispanics and African Americans in American music cannot be denied. It, it means that the majority have, been, have incorporated these musical values and created a new, uniquely American style. Uh, another thing is the tendency in America to reject formality. So compare, for example, many other cultures, the language itself has a difference in your, when you talk to somebody formally versus informally. So for example, in Spanish, if I speak to somebody in, in like my boss, or sometimes uh, uh, an old uh, parent, uh, I would use the form usted. And usted is a form of uh, respect, formality. I'm giving them, uh, uh, I'm establishing a formal relationship. Whereas amongst friends, you would use a very different conjugation. You would use the, verb, the word to, and the verb tenses would all be changed. So this reflects much more, in America, we only use the one form, the two form, basically, you. Uh, also think about, for example, in America, we, we shake hands, which is a, uh, tends to be a symbolism of equality and friendship between people, versus in many Eastern cultures, people bow, and bowing is uh, 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 showing of respect normally to somebody who is a higher hierarchy than you. Populism. Populism is this general belief that ordinary people should be the dominant force in politics. It's not exactly the same as democracy. Democracy is this idea that of the people controlling. Populism is more 
Oh, we're the true Americans, the ordinary people. It's a, a somewhat anti-elitist conception of how the country should be run. And America is a unique somewhat for its dislike for elites, and particularly elites who, who espouse or, or believe they're better or smarter than other people. We, we hate eggheads. We hate people who, I should say, we don't like. We don't, we don't get along with them. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying all Americans, but uh, in that root sense, uh, you would say most Americans don't feel comfortable with somebody who's a member of the elite. Uh, again, the Constitution bans aristocratic titles. Uh, there's a lot of distrust, again, among people on the right, among people on the left, uh, people in rural areas, many poorer people, uh, of corporate elites, the idea that the, the country is run or controlled by corporate elites, or even Hollywood elites, right? The, the people in Hollywood are changing our values and things like that. We tend to like, if you look at who tends to get elected, you look at people who tend to be uh, seen as one of us, right? So pre-candidates who can, who can come across as the guy next door are more likely to win an election than candidates who come across as, I'm smart, let me read the country because I'm a smart person, I can do things. And this again tends to be very different from Europe. In Europe, they tend to vote for people who they think of as smarter uh, than the average person because they want a smarter person in office. Um, but in America, we don't. We want somebody who's like us, right? Compare, for example, George Bush Sr. I have here a picture of a classic moment in the uh, election when George Bush was running against Bill Clinton, and this was in 1992. You wouldn't know this, but George Bush, of course, was then the incumbent. He was running for his second term. He got, he got elected on his first term because, of course, he was associated with Ronald Reagan, who, again, was a very popular uh, man who, who was like the everyman American, uh, even though I disagreed with him in many, many ways. I have to give him credit that he uh, came across in a very uh, homely way, as it were. But George Bush Sr., people never trusted him. He always seemed to be an elitist. He was part of the corporate elite. And then one day during his campaign in 1992, he decided to go to a supermarket and have like a, a media event. And you can see him here in the picture. He's got his juices and his apples. And he's like, here I am. I'm just the ordinary person. And then he asked a weird question. He said, what is this thing here? What is this? The scanner. He didn't know what the scanner was, right? Now, you know what a scanner is. Every time you go to the store or the supermarket, beep, beep, they scan the objects, right? It's a new technology. Now, when George Bush went into the White House, there were no scanners. When he came out, all the supermarkets had scanners. He had never seen a scanner because he'd been in the White House or in government uh, as vice president or as president for 12 years, obviously he hadn't really had any need to go down to the corner store. So it was a natural thing for him to ask. There's nothing wrong with it. But the point is, everybody said, oh my God, this guy is such an elitist, he doesn't even know what a scanner is. So it became a scandal. Literally, in my opinion, he lost the election because he didn't know what a scanner was. And in that, he affirmed people's beliefs that he simply was not one of us. He didn't live in the same world as we did. He was an elitist. Uh, think of Al Gore. I mean, I personally thought Al Gore would, be, would have made a great president. He was very smart, very dedicated. He uh, was very concerned about the environment. Um, but I have to agree, he looked like a robot when he got up to speak. He did not, he was not able to convince people that he, that he cared. He did. I really, I sincerely believe he did, but he did not come across that way. And even me as a supporter, I would watch him giving a speech 
and he just did not inspire inspiration. Uh, compared to Bill Clinton, who gave a speech, and even if you hated him, by the end of his speech, you would have tears coming out of your eyes. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, again, another person I, I admire a lot and, and personally supported for president. But again, I have to agree, Hillary Clinton made a big mistake taking a lot of money from, uh, from uh, corporate clients for giving speeches because she was already seen as an egghead. She was already seen as part of the elite uh, whether whether corporate elite or liberal elite or whatever you want to call it, and it just yeah you know, having having all those two million dollar checks coming from corporate uh, businesses just didn't look good. It just made her look like she had she was part of the elite. In fact, she was a a very she was born in a middle class family, uh, salt to the earth. But again, what's important is perception, and people didn't like it. And when you compare, for example, with people like Bernie Sanders, who uh, you know comes across again like Ronald Reagan as a very personable person, you might <clears throat> not agree with him, but you certainly say this is somebody, this is a real American standing up. Uh, Donald Trump again evinces the same type of uh, of persona in a in a different way, obviously. I don't personally like Donald Trump. I don't like his policies or his ideas. But you have to admit, he stands up and he says things, and they may see they may be miraculous, but he he, he does it, and uh, his followers love him for it. So individualism. Now, uh, uh, again, it almost seems a cliche to say that Americans are very individualistic. What's interesting is, in fact, we're not really that much more individualistic than anybody else. Americans follow fads, they follow fashions, they conform in, in many varieties of ways. I mean, look at the fact that uh, in the 50s, everybody wore a suit. Suddenly in the 60s, everybody's wearing blue jeans, right? In both cases, they're conforming to a, to a fashion, to a fad, to what everybody else is doing. Right? Very few Americans actually in the 60s went out with a suit because they would look ridiculous. Um, but as a value, we clearly value individualism very highly. Uh, when you look at people's choices, so for example, Americans uh, uh, are quite happy to take a job that would move them thousands of miles away from other members of the family or old friends. Right? Whereas you compare to other cultures, for example, I live in Kurdistan and I talk to people, look, there's a job here, uh, you have to live in the field for two weeks. And they're like, oh, I can't do that. My family, how would I, how would I live away from my family? <laughs> uh, or people have gone abroad and they'll come back. They'll come back. Even though they have a great job abroad, they'll come back because they want to be with their family. Family is very, very important. Or compared to Korea, when you go to Korea to a football match, everybody wears the team colors. Everybody does the same moves and dances. People want to fit in. They want to be like everybody else. They don't want to be individuals. Uh, compared to America, we, we feel very uncomfortable doing things as a mass. And it usually only happens on very rare occasions when we kind of forget ourselves, like at a rock concert, and then everybody gets into it. Um, now, uh, we have uh, in America a uh, much more pronounced adolescent uh, period of rebellion than you have in other cultures because, again, we have that conflict between the family and the adolescent striving for their individuality. There's even, I might say, an admiration for deviance. You look at American movies and how many movies we have that glorify criminals, right? Or make criminals like Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, make them out to be heroes, and the police are the bad guys. The FBI are the bad guys, right? So we tend to admire people who, who do things uh, on their own. Now, people might say that a lot of this comes back to our history, the influence of American, the frontier, cheap land, that it was easy to go out, uh, the, the automobile culture in America that gave people the ability to move around 
by, uh, on their own and to have a, a, a lot of independence that people didn't have in Europe, where people are more crowded together, where there's no new area you can go to uh, in for most cases. And so people ended up living, you know, they're born, they live and they died in the same neighborhood. Uh, and this is very rare in America when you look at, you might look at your own families, of course every family is different, but in my family, when I look at my grandparents, they were from the, uh, they lived on the East Coast, my great-grandparents came from Europe, my uh, parents' uh, generation all lived in the Midwest, then they all came to, then they uh, spread out to California and other areas. So literally, if I looked at my, my immediate family, brothers and sisters, they're all over the world. I'm in Iraq, one's in Colorado, used to be in Hawaii, the other's in California. And if you look at my cousins, they're all over the United States. So we spread out and we don't, I mean, it's not that we don't like our families necessarily, but we just choose our own individual process, paths. Laissez-faire, again, this kind of comes back to uh, anti-government. <clears throat> Laissez-faire is a French term for let it be. And again, it's classical liberal philosophy, the idea that the government should not control the economy and should not control people's everyday lives. And again, you think about uh, the origins uh, of uh, American, at least in our mythology, perhaps, you have the Puritans who came to America because they didn't want the government controlling their religion. You had people who came to Virginia because they wanted to be free of the shackles of Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. Now again, as I said, a lot of that is mythology, but there's also some truth in there. Uh, the people who came to America were the entrepreneurs. They were the ones who wanted to be different, whereas the people who were happy being the same, they stayed in Europe. Think of this, the Fifth Amendment states, nobody can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This Fifth Amendment basically makes it impossible for any type of socialist solution to be had in the United States. Even if you wanted to set up a government-run medical program, for example, like the National Health Service in England, you couldn't do it. It's illegal under the Fifth Amendment because you'd be taking away the property of the current owners of hospitals and medical clinics and doctors' associations, and they would claim that their rights had been violated. Of course, they could be compensated, but like it says, they would have to take place. It would be very expensive. Agency versus fatalism. This is not mentioned by Martin Lipset, but when you think about, you know, many cultures, people are fatalistic. In other words, they believe that there's karma or fate controlling their lives that they don't really have control, that, that God is going to determine everything. Uh, Islam, for example, emphasizes obedience to God's word. You go to Asia, people emphasize karma. Now, of course, uh, we, we, we use these words like luck and karma and fate in English, and they do, they do have a certain amount of belief in America. But Americans tend to have a very profound belief in their own ability to control their own lives and even change the world, right? So America from the very beginning has very, been very progressive. It's always wanted to change things, make the world better, make the world, give the world a brighter future. Uh, you have the notion of self-reliance, uh, that we believe we should be able to pull, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Um, individual responsibility, that we cannot just say, well, it was God's will, like they say in Arabic, um, uh, inshallah, if God wills it, right? It'll happen if God wills it. We don't have that type of expression in English. We don't say, if it is God's will. No, we say, I'll do it, or I won't do it, right? And we take responsibility for it. Uh, think of the, the notion of America as a shining light on a hill. Now, on the one hand, this, has, this is tended to support a somewhat 
somewhat aggressive foreign policy sometimes, um, but sometimes it supports isolationism. Americans are likely to say, well, the rest of the world, they're just a cesspool. It's not worth dealing with their problems. So we kind of gravitate or, or uh, between these two uh, options. One is we want to go out and save the world, and the other because the world is a terrible place and we want to help them. Or the world is a cesspool and it's not worth doing anything um, to help them because they won't appreciate it anyway. So why is the U.S. so different from Europe if most Europe Americans came from Europe? Right? Uh, of course, a Marxist might say this is false consciousness. Uh, American wor working class have always been relatively well off compared to their European counterparts. And right? why? Because they have higher salaries, there's a lot of free land, the food was very cheap, you had slavery, that meant for white workers or white immigrants would have a privileged position in society. So Marxists uh, very often have argued that American workers have been bought off. Basically, they've been given all these privileges because of the ability of the ruling class to exploit minorities and uh, take steel land from Native Americans and, and use that to bolster a white working class that would be very loyal and would buy into this kind of American exceptionalism. But there are other arguments. One is a cultural argument. For example, yes, people came from Europe, but they weren't, the, they weren't your everyday Europeans. They were people who came for a reason. So they weren't necessarily typical of their cultures of origin. Immigrants were more likely to be entrepreneurial or were more likely to want more freedom, like the Puritans wanted religious freedom. Uh, adventurers who wanted to come and seek out their own life. Entrepreneurs, uh, even, even petty criminals. A lot of criminals were sent to America as punishment. Maybe that's why we like deviants so much. Australia kind of has the same thing because also a lot of criminals were sent there for punishment. Either way, it means that, um, that this might explain why Americans are much more likely to be individualist, much more likely to be anti-government, much more likely to, to want to be self-reliant. Another argument is the effect of the frontier. Because of all this land, people could spread out. Uh, and, America, and many uh, Americans did, again, particularly white immigrants, uh, had the privilege of going out and finding their own land and being independent and, and experiencing that feeling of, of uh, relative power as it was. Um, it made them more likely to raise their economic status individually as compared to people who were stuck back in Europe. Uh, a belief in self-efficiency is, again, like I said, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, now, as I said, this came at the expense of Native Americans and, and African Americans and other minority groups who actually did uh, or gave up a lot of their rights in order for, uh, I shouldn't say gave up, lost a lot of their rights in order for these things to happen. Symbolic interactionism might focus on the symbolism throughout our history of the revolution incorporating itself into core values. So, for example, when America revolted against England, it wasn't a civil war. It was, in many ways, a war against the English government. Americans didn't hate English people. They hated the English government, and they did not want to be controlled by the English government. And the English government at that time was very autocratic. It was very authoritarian. There was a parliament in England, but Americans were not represented in that parliament. So parliament did not protect Americans against the abuses of the crown. Uh, and many of the, many of the guarantees, for example, of private property, the guarantees of rights of criminal suspects, the limits on government were all put in the Constitution because these were specifically grievances Americans had against uh, Crown uh, uh, practices. That the Crown would come and, and force you to take a bunch of soldiers into your house and feed them at your own expense. 
or the government would come and just take your property uh, because they felt like they needed it or you were maybe suspected. Or such person would be thrown into prison and treated like criminals even if there was no evidence against them. So think about, for example, the New Hampshire motto, live free or die. I mean, it sounds pretty dramatic, but it kind of uh, it, it encapsulates the concept of being free from this type of government autocracy that Americans have never really ever wanted to uh, live under again. One thing's for sure, nobody can understand Americans. All right, thank you very much, and I apologize, this was rather a long lecture, uh, but I hope you uh, got something out of it. Please read the article again, because I think you'll find it even more informative. Have a good day. See you next time.